and and her mother park their caravan for the night, she tells her daughter an ancient tale about how their kingdom was once the land of the fairies who loved beautiful and fun things and how they lived quietly and peacefully for hundreds of years. The entranced child watches on as her mother pours some sugar on the table, Anna comments on the current terrible state of the fairies. Her mother explains that 500 years ago humans rose in rebellion and made fairies their servants. The consensus is that the fairies were too laid back that is why they lost to the humans, but she thinks otherwise and holds the opinion that there were simply fewer fairies than humans. All the while, she was creating beautiful detailed sugar sculpture of a fairy which dazzles and she scrapes a little piece and gives it for her to eat. The child loves the taste. She continues to explain that sugar confections are a sacred food as they extend the lifespan of fairies and bring good fortune to humans. Fairies were the first ones to make these sugar confections and mastered the method of refining sugar apples into silver sugar. So that is why sugar artisans, especially silver sugar masters, must never look down on fairies and should keep company with them as friends and promise to do so. Some time has passed and a 15-year-old Anne stands over her mother's grave reminiscing on that night. She places some flowers on the grave while praying for her mother's protection as she prepares to go on her journey to become a silver sugar master like her. The young lady finishes packing and checks her carriage before getting off. Jonas calls for her to wait just as she's about to leave. He begins to berate her trying to go without saying goodbye to anyone. She apologizes but knows that if she did tell him, he would have tried to stop her and expresses her gratitude to his family and the village people for how they treated her and her mother. She reminds him that she wishes to enter the year's sugar confectionery exhibition and pleads with him to understand. He does because he too is a sugar artisan but he feels like it is going to be impossible for her to travel to Lewiston alone. She later arrives at a village where the residents are gathered around watching a situation unfold in horror. The young lady is curious to know what is going on so she stops to find out. To her dismay, a labor fairy who serves a fairy hunter is being stepped on for all to see. An old man explains that the fairy stole his own wings and tried to escape. The hunter shows the fairy its wings and proceeds to crush it which causes immense pain to the little creature as it loudly winces on the floor. The wings are the source of a fairy's life force, even if their wings are ripped off, they can survive. However, if their wings are damaged, they get weakened and can die. With that knowledge, humans rip off a single wing to force fairies to obey them. This is how fairies ended up subjugated by humans. The girl is surprised that no one is stepping up to save the little guy. The old timer points out that the fairy hunter has a violent personality so no one wants to risk their safety to save a fairy because things can easily go wrong and the hunter can turn on the rescuer. The hunter threatens to end his servant and is eager to make him promise to never try such a stunt again but the fairy is still defiant. Without hesitation, and steps up and confronts the bully by kicking him in the back of the knee before he can turn around. This causes him to fall and hurl the little creature in the air and catches the fairy and its wings before they hit the floor. The mood of the crowd suddenly changes as they laugh at her slapstick attack. She returns the fairy its wings and it snatches it back before jumping from her hands and running off. She pleads for it to wait but it shouts that it will never thank a human for anything and only wears an understanding smile knowing that she's not like the majority of humans. The hunter interrupts her moment of reflection when he angrily shouts at her for allowing his valuable labor fairy to escape. He wants to know how she will rectify the situation, but she matches his energy pointing out that he was planning to end the fairy, so in essence, the fairy escaping like that shouldn't make a difference to the hunter because his services have ceased either way. Her comment only angers the hunter so he recoils his hand to hit her, but the crowd will not allow it and start to berate him for raising his hand at the young lady. They use it as an opportunity to criticize his treatment of the fairy too. The verbal jumping from the crowd forces him to stop his course of action, but he promises to not let it go. The villagers warn him to never return as the old man praises Anne's bravery despite her small body, so she informs him that she's only a young lady. She feels a little guilty as she asks the senior citizen to point her in the direction of the fairy market shortly after she arrives there to the sight of different types of fairies caged up and being advertised for sale. As she navigates through, they alert her to their different roles and services, and asks the dealer if he has any warrior fairies for sale, but he informs her that he doesn't carry anything as dangerous as that but points her to a different vendor who has one. But he advises her not to buy it because it's defective goods, she proceeds forward to the hut where the fairy is held and pries inside. The fairy's beautiful wings dazzle in the tiny bit of sunlight that creeps its way into the area. She notices Shao's slender frame, and when he opens his eyes, 
they mirror the cosmos, and is in awe of him as she has never seen a fairy like him before. The magical moment is ruined when he calls and a scarecrow, the young lady gets offended by that comment and scolds him for it. The seller emerges and apologizes on behalf of his product complaining about his sharp tongue. He reveals that she'll insult anyone that passes by regardless of the person's status, so she should pay him no mind and continue on her journey. She tells the seller that with such a tongue he will struggle to sell him as a companion fairy so he should just release him. The dealer corrects her disclosing that it is a warrior fairy, not a companion type. He commends his battle prowess stating that three hunters met their demise while trying to capture him. But she is skeptical because all the warrior fairies she has seen up until this point has been bullier and bigger. He assures that fairy traders don't lie because trust is the most important thing to them. She makes him aware that she did want to buy a warrior fairy but she's not confident with the current offering so she wants a different one. The warrior types are more difficult to handle so he's the only one available, but he asks her to try her luck elsewhere. Shell interrupts and tells her to buy him, and is surprised by how bold he is, and the dealer finds the whole interaction funny and informs her that it's the first time he's ever heard him ask someone to buy him. He teases Shell asking him if he has fallen in love with and the fairy gives a witty response that offends the dealer. He pulls out his wing and crushes it which sends a shock wave of pain across Shell's heart and pleads for him to stop. As he fends her off he starts to call his price and squeezes the wing again, she can't stand seeing him in pain so she decides to offer him a gold coin which he humbly accepts. This is followed by some pain relief for Shell as the dealer gives the wing to and who removes it from the pouch to inspect as it expands to its original size. All the while the fairy complains about his heart while recovering from the attack. Shortly after, the dealer gives her a final warning about how savage fairies can be and emphasizes for her not to let her guard down or Shell will immediately steal her leather pouch before offing her. The fairy overhears and adds that he will come and off the dealer too. She reprimands him for that comment before leaving with him. The dealer wonders if she can make him serve her but shall sarcastically says that she can, which annoys her, and continues her journey with her new bodyguard and notifies him that she's heading to Lewiston and would like him to protect her. Shell jokes around that it's a simple task he will even throw in a kiss as a special service, but she declines which only gives him more causes to tease her. After some back and forth they introduce themselves, she promises him that once they arrive in Lewiston, she will return his wing to him. He's perplexed by her statement because she spent a lot of money on him, so he calls her naive but she just believes that humans and fairies can be friends. She also doesn't want to sell him to another human because of her beliefs and would like to develop that relationship during their travels, but Shell lets her know that they could never be friends. He even insults her mother which makes her angry, but she restrains herself. Shell expands on his point while being a little flirtatious, he discloses that it was because of her naivety which compelled him to request she buys him. They continue their journey in silence till they reach the bloody highway, as its name implies it is dangerous and full of wild animals that attack indiscriminately, even if one avoids them there are also bandits to fight off. Shell is aware her main reason for buying him was, because of this part of the journey, they travel part of the way through till nightfall without any incident. The duo set up camp and she provides him with some food and tries to touch his attached wing but he blasts her for being insensitive. She apologizes before going to bed, she has a dream about her mother and suddenly wakes up to Shell trying to steal his wing back. And gets upset by his attempted betrayal, he points out how can they be friends when she holds his life in her hands, this is forced service not employment. The words ring true in her head, but she is still upset and wraps herself to prevent him from attempting to take it again. While she sleeps, Shell thinks about his nearly 70 years and forced servitude to humans, but his attention is taken by the scent of silver sugar that emanates from in and he wonders why. The following day, they carry on their journey on the highway when they come across some bandits attacking a carriage. The bad actors see the duo and proceed to attack them. As they draw closer, and pleads for Shell to dispatch them but he wants to hear her order him, she musters up the words to do so which prompts him into action. Shell summons his sword and swiftly cuts down their attacks before the danger can reach in. After seeing his skill, the bandits retreat, and Shell stands there as and admires him. The story continues with Shell turning around to meet En's gaze as she stares at residual evidence of the battle on him. She admires the beauty of his blade as it drips red. Their little stare down is interrupted when it is revealed the unknown carriage that they met getting attacked belongs to Jonas. He steps out and is surprised to see En. She's even more stunned to see him as she stumbles on his name. With the shock out of their system, they move forward in unison as she asks him why he's on this path. Jonas states that he ran after her because he was worried, but he is glad that she's safe and promises to protect her from now on. This confuses her because they rather saved him from a bandit attack 
The guy pretends to not have heard that and swiftly changes the topic. He finds it strange that he caught up to her so quickly, so she informs him of the detour she took to a nearby village. Jonas looks over to Shell who rides the other carriage and figures out that she went there to buy her warrior fairy and he comments on his beauty. He asks her if she picked a pet fairy by mistake because there is nothing warrior-like about Shell, but she retorts by pleading for him to go back because the journey is too dangerous for him. He refuses to go back and stands firm that he's going to follow her to Lewiston because he loves her. She's happy by his words, but she thinks that he has mistaken having sympathy for her as love. He grabs her hand to let her know that he means his words, Shell interrupts their little moment to inform them that they must move immediately from their current location because the scavenger crows are gathering. He explains they only appear when they smell blood, so if one sees them, it indicates that wolves are in the area. And quickly transitions to her carriage with the help of her bodyguard, he teases her because a man came for her, but she lets him know that her relationship with Jonas is not like that at all, he is just sympathetic towards her. Shell makes a mental note of that statement. She asks him again to go back as she pulls away from him and proceeds on looking glumly, she turns back to see that Jonas is still following them as he waves at her with a smile on his face. She resumes her position with a heavy sigh and pleads with Shell to protect Jonas's carriage too if they face any danger. The warrior fairy informs her that if she wants him to do something she must threaten to crush his wing or order him to do it. She gets angry because he keeps asking her to do that, although she has decided to be his master, she's not comfortable commanding him so she prefers to ask first before getting more aggressive which he finds a bit strange. That night, they decide to lodge at an abandoned fort given the nature of the environment. Jonas is excited because this is his first time camping, the noble reveals that since he set off, he rode through the night because he wanted to catch up to Anne as quickly as possible. She tells him to make a return trip the following day now that he has checked on her. Jonas informs her that he's decided to make the journey for himself now, but we all know he's there for her and makes a one-pot soup for everyone in the camp to enjoy. She serves some for Jonas and his servant fairy Kathy opens the door. She gives harsh critique regarding the food because the noble is used to eating high-quality meals and tells her to be grateful for the food as they are in the middle of a journey. She storms off and serves Shell hoping he doesn't diss the food, the gesture confuses him. Not only did she serve him, but she also did so before eating herself, the young lady just thinks of it as a common courtesy and forgot to give him a spoon so she rushes to go pick one up for him but Shell uses his powers to absorb the meal as she returns with it. He explains that fairies don't use their mouths to eat so they don't taste food. The only thing they ingest is silver sugar and gets up and promises to make some for him that night revealing to him that she is a novice silver sugar maker. She makes her way to the back of her carriage to begin preparation but some sudden unknown movement inside scares her into Shell's arms and pleads for him to take care of it but he wants her to order him, she refuses and decides to face it herself. The novice sugar maker enters with a stick after a tense moment of silence, the culprit jumps out at her, so she hits it with the stick which sends it flying into Shao's personal space. Turns out that it is Mithril, a fairy and saved in the previous village, he formally introduces himself and alerts her that he has come to repay her kindness but he will not thank her for the help because he hates humans. She doesn't feel like he needs to repay her, so she just tries to send him away wishing him all the best. But he is adamant that he must repay his debt. Left with no other option she just asks Mithril to oil her carriage's tire joint. It just offends him because he feels like to repay the debt for saving his life, the task she has given him is too menial, so she should think of something bigger. Shell grabs the little fairy because he's making too much noise and asks and if she wishes it dead. She pleads for Shell to put him down, Mithril vows to follow her till he pays the debt. His giddiness has made and tired, so she decides to go to bed and promises to make the sugar candy the next night. The following morning, she wakes up with bags under her eyes because Mithril didn't allow her to have a good night's sleep. All the while, he sleeps to make up his deficit, Shell offers to throw him overboard but she prevents her bodyguard from doing so. She later halts to fetch some water when the lover boy joins her and expresses his worries, she stops asking him to go back because they have traveled too far inside the bloody highway so it would be murder to send him back alone. She therefore reluctantly agrees for them to go to Lewiston together. He takes it as her accepting him, which is not the case, 
she warns him of the dangers that they are going to face, with them officially joining the traveling party and formally introduces Shell to Jonas and Kathy. The noble finds it strange that she kept his fairy's name and didn't give him a human one. He comments that Shell is unnecessarily beautiful to be a warrior fairy and says he could sell for a pet fairy as well. Shell comes in with his sharp tongue and says he doesn't mind if he wants to buy him from him because, in terms of stupidity, Jonas and his current owner are on the same level. Somebody cover this guy with a fire blanket because he's roasting at a high level. And apologizes for his comments, she confesses that she has been called those names too, but Jonas is willing to take the insults for love. Mithril also introduces himself while he chills on Anne's lap. By the time he finishes the soup is ready, so she prepares to serve everyone. However, Kathy has already set up her master's dinner and it's quite the spread. And sees and comments that he doesn't need her soup, Kathy answers and insults her food again. This annoys Jonas who tells her to go invisible. He apologizes on his fairy's behalf and compliments the food promising to eat it next time. She wonders if she should take a page out of Jonas's book with the way he's dealing with his fairy. The following day, while on the road, Mithril explains the different kinds of fairy abilities to in. Fairies are born from either berries and fruits or droplets and gems. Their birth occurs when the energy from the materials condenses. However, to complete the process a living thing needs to gaze at the reaction. This can be either a human or an animal. The gaze give the condensed energy shape, allowing it to turn into fairies. She's curious to know what material shell was born from, Looking at him, Mithril identifies that he was made from obsidian. He adds that fairies made from gems can make sharp objects, which explains where Shal's blade came from. Mithril reveals that he was born from water and proceeds to demonstrate his power by creating a water ball which he fires at Anne's face. But because of his small size, it is more of a droplet to the face than anything, Shal makes fun of its potency which annoys the little fairy. Mithril stops his complaining when he notices a flock of wild crows that have their eyes on them. Shal explains that the crows are scattered scavengers who eat decaying meat but when there is none available, they attack the living and eat them alive. He suspects that they were drawn to the battle they had the previous day, but their appetite was not satisfied. They begin to swoop and start having a little taste of Jonas first, and notices and orders Shell to defend them from the wild crows and adds a threat to his rip his wings for good measure. He orders them to stop and enter their respective carriages while he deals with his problem. Mithril sees this as an opportunity for him to repay his debt so he prepares to also face them, but and grabs him inside before he causes more problems than solutions. Soon after, the birds make a nose dive as Shell begins to engage them, the shaking of her carriage from the birds assault causes Anne to become scared. Mithril tries to calm her down assuring her that Shell is made out of obsidian so he's different from the other fairies, no matter how much the birds attack he will not get scratched nor will he get broken. Meanwhile, the bodyguard is doing his job as he effortlessly cuts through all the birds. Suddenly, the noise and shaking stops so and comes out to check and sees Shell standing there among a sea of dead crows. She falls to the ground out of relief, he immediately deactivates his sword and proceeds over to his master. He asks if he got her weak in the knees which causes her to spring up to deny it, by this time he has closed the distance, so he whisks her off her feet which takes her breath away. She stares at him, so he asks if she wants more service, this causes her to blush as she jumps down thanking him for saving them. I hope Jonas had his notepad out because Shell just demonstrated how Chad's move. Later that evening, and worries because the attack from the wild crows has put them behind schedule, so they might reach the next lodging before the sun sets. She sees a medic lodging nearby which means that there is a doctor there that will let pilgrims rest for the night. According to her sources, bandits don't attack doctors for some strange reason, so for pilgrims, it's one of the safest places. Shell questions the accuracy of that map because it's really old. She gets defensive because her mother drew it so she believes that the map can't be wrong. She makes the executive decision that they will proceed to the medic lodging. Shell is curious to know what happened to her mother. She notifies him of her passing and wants to become a sugar master so that she can show her work at the Royal Candy Fair in Lewiston and get the king's recognition. She also wants to get her mom's spirit to heaven on pure soul day this winter using her sugar skills. Their conversation is interrupted when the doors of the lodge begin to close but her shouts causes the doctor to stop and check. They tell him of their day's troubles, he offers them room and some food, and jumps on the bed happy because it has been so long since she slept in one. After settling in their rooms, they come down to eat. They meet some other lodgers playing a card game, one of them looks over at the new arrivals. The story continues with the doctor alerting the party that two other travelers arrived earlier and gestures for them to take a seat at the free table. He serves Anne and Jonas their food, 
but she looks at their fairy companions with confusion as to why they are standing watching them. She asks them to come and sit down so that they can all eat. Jonas is a little shocked by her statement and whispers to her that the idea of fairies eating in front of people is completely absurd. As he explains, one of the travelers overhears everything and begins to give her a side eye out of curiosity. The doctor pauses in his tracks and continues to listen to her confess that they have been eating together while on the road. Jonas notifies again that this should not be done in front of other people. She kindly asks the doctor innkeeper if it would be possible for their fairies to eat with them. He informs them that he's not the type that would mind but there are other guests around that he also has to consider. Hugh quickly green lights them stating that it doesn't bother him or his companion. He uses this as an opportunity to break the ice with the other party asking Anne for her name. He also introduces himself and notifies her to drop the formalities. As the two talk, Hugh's travel companion Salim exchanges a glance with Shell. Through their discussion Hugh hears about their journey to Lewison for the sugar confectionery exhibition being held there. Jonas alerts him of their intention to enter the exhibition, so he deducts that they must be sugar artisans. He thinks that they are being a bit extravagant looking at their two labor fairies and what he presumes to be a companion fairy, and is quick to correct him that Shell isn't a companion fairy but a warrior type who is her guard. Hugh believes she's lying and tells her not to be embarrassed because of course she would fall for a fairy that looks as good as Shell. He wouldn't be surprised if that was the reason she bought him, but she protests that narrative. Hugh decides to put her claim to the test by having his companion throw a chair at Shell, but he swiftly catches it and puts it back down. He then dashes towards him with a powerful sword attack but Shell blocks it with ease. Hugh's guy is impressed with his combat ability. Shell on the other hand asks if he wants to be ended, but his attacker doesn't think he's able to. Hugh has seen enough and orders Selene to withdraw his sword and begins to admonish him and threatens action if he harms any of her companions. The traveler apologizes and almost can't believe such a handsome high quality warrior fairy exists. To show his sincerity, Hugh decides to pay for their stay. This calms and down a little when she hears that. He feels like he'll be taking a loss if he does that, so he suggests that the two make some sugar confection for him around the size of a human fist. This will allow him to gain some value from the loss he's about to make and agrees to his terms and conditions. She goes to the back of her wagon with Jonas where she gets two bowls of sugar. He worries that she will not have enough to make her piece for the exhibition. She informs him that she has more than enough in the three sealed barrels. Jonas is happy to hear this and notes that the judges do assess the entrance sugar refining skills. He starts to get excited just thinking about the exhibition. He reveals to and that he might be getting recommended to the head of the artisan school he belongs to. But to be the head, he would have to be awarded a royal medal and become a silver sugar master. So and suggests he enters the exhibition this year, but he alerts her that he just wants to watch this time around. However, he is aware that for him to achieve his goals he has to participate and win in the future. He also wants to be the Silver Sugar Viscount if all else fails. Silver Sugar Viscount is a sugar master who exclusively works for the royal family. This surprises Anne a little. He asks her to marry him again promising to become the Sugar Viscount and to make her happy, but she cuts him off not wanting to talk about that topic. By the time they arrive back inside the inn, Hugh has already prepared all the equipment they will need. He makes it known to them that will be no need to color the sugar confections, apart from that he gives them full creative freedom to do whatever they want, and suspects that he might be a sugar artisan given the equipment he has provided for them, but he just tells her to stop all the speculation and make something. As they prepare the sugar, he watches them intently, and wonders what to make and thinks of what her mother would do. After some time, the two finish their work. Hugh inspects it and praises them for their proficiency, and made a flower while Jonas sculpted a cat, from what they have presented he can see they're not novices. The two smile at each other but that soon turns to shock when Hugh smashes their work simultaneously. He explains that they were unsightly, so he destroyed them. He begins with Jonas by acknowledging his skills but Hugh feels like that is where it ends as all he wants to do is show off his technique and doesn't add any of his ingenuity. And did better than Jonas but to him, it feels as though she created an imitation of something someone else had made. Basically, he called her a copycat and essentially saying she used chat GPT. Hugh frankly tells them that with work like this, their hopes of becoming silver sugar masters are no more than dreams. He informs them that he will accept what it has been reduced to as Salim scoops the fragments in a bowl. Hugh will have them as a snack, he eats one while he gets up to leave for his room. Jonas tries to reassure her, but she runs off to her room upset, 
Shell later catches up with her to find her crying under her bed covers. She scolds him for finding amusement in someone's depression, but this just makes him chuckle further. He begins to talk about her current state and how it will not stay the same forever, because humans change as time goes on. He uses her as an example. He believes that in three years, she will become startlingly pretty when her hair will turn a beautiful pale gold. Shell also knows that her skills at making sugar confections will change. This prompts her to state that she would have honed them even more to show Hugh how much she can improve. But she feels like Shell is only saying these lies to comfort her, but he tells her that they are not lies. Shell begins to tell her about how he was born because of a noble child's gaze. Her name was Liz and she lived away from society because of certain circumstances. She was young and knew nothing of the world so mistook him for her older brother and led him back to her mansion for shelter. He continues saying that at 15 years of age, she grew into a fine woman with blonde hair. He suggests that and two will continue to change as he speaks from experience. And asks what happened to Liz, he notifies her that she had passed away at the hands of humans. She tries to console him but he moves away from her and tells her to get some sleep. The following day, the party set off after Hugh paid for their stay as promised. Jonas tries to talk to Anne, but she ignores him as she is deep in thought about what she'll disclose the previous night. She finds it interesting that he has an emotional bond with a human girl at one point and notices that he spent the same amount of time with Liz as she did with her mother. So for him, Liz might have been like family and that was stolen from him by humans. These people caused his heart to freeze over and at this point, they set camp for the night. She wishes she could do something to melt it back to normal and remembers that she promised to make Shell some sugar confections so she makes her way to prepare it in hopes it will bring a little warmth to his heart. The girl opens the sugar drum to find it empty, Shell hears the commotion and comes to check on her. Although she has three barrels of sugar, she wouldn't have enough to make her entry piece. Jonas joins them when he hears her crying, they gather around the campfire to get to the bottom of this. Kathy alerts everyone that she saw Mithril coming out of her cargo hold with silver sugar all over him. He overhears the commotion and comes down from his nap. When they tell him of the situation, he denies it swearing he didn't do it. Kathy looks away with a guilty face. Mithril storms off upset when he realizes that and suspects that he took the sugar. Jonas gets an idea. The following day they set off as lover boy explains that he heard from his school that there is a grove of sugar apple trees on the bloody highway. It takes three days to refine silver sugar so they will have enough time for her to make it if they can find it. After some traveling, they find the grove, she excitedly rushes over to the bright red apples where they proceed to pick them. Later that evening, they make camp and begin to cook the apples to release the natural sugars. Over the coming days, they strain the sugar syrup into molds for them to dry. While they wait, she makes soup for Shell to enjoy but she worries about Mithril who has not returned yet, and reveals she doesn't care who stole the sugar, her goal is to make sure she finishes her work on time. She must enter the exhibition and makes her way to the back to decide the piece she wants to submit. The girl looks through some of the secret drawing her mother gave her before she passed away. The piece has to be large bright and beautiful, as she thinks, the criticism that Hugh gave begins to play in her head. Jonas interrupts her to give her a barrel in which to put the new sugar. She's grateful but tells him that she already has two empty barrels. At this point Anne has an idea of what she wants to do and has begun to work. Jonas is impressed with what she has done so far, to the point that he pulls her closer and leans in for a kiss, but she slaps him. This shocks him, she tells Jonas plainly that she doesn't love him despite his feelings for her. The simp was hoping that he could win her heart, he apologizes for his forwardness before leaving a bit broken. Later that night, Kathy comes over to berate her and from the fairy's speech, and figures out that Kathy loves Jonas. When she confronts her about it, she storms off red-faced, this gets her thinking about such relationships between fairies and humans. She feels a little jealous when she thinks that Shal and Liz could have been like that when she got older, and works through the night and finally finishes her piece and it looks magnificent, she steps out for some fresh air while her work dries. She's happy that she finished on time as the exhibition is the following day, Shal reveals that when he first met her at the fairy market he could smell the sweetness of silver sugar coming from her hand which is what piqued his curiosity. As Shell smiles at her, Jonas ruins the moment as he rushes over to compliment and on her masterpiece, he is confident that she will win the royal medal. She thanks him and is grateful that he told her about the sugar apples, and notices that Jonas has tied his horse to her wagon, and he alerts her that he thinks they should set off. She informs him that he's been too hasty because the processing of silver sugar hasn't finished yet. She notices Kathy luring a vicious pack of wolves to their location as Jonas explains that he wouldn't have had to do this if she had just accepted to marry him. 
The fairy throws the bait all over her as Jonas sets off with her presentation piece waving her goodbye. The pack surrounds the girl and her guard. She pleads for Shell to go after the wagon and leave her. She feels like her work is more important than her life. Shell fights off the wolf's attack as and cries into his chest. Things continue with Shell dealing the final blow to the last of the pack of wolves that attack them. He deactivates his weapon and turns to see and slouched on the floor covered in the bait. She queries him as to why he didn't go after Jonas. He explains that if he did, the wolves would have had her for breakfast, dinner, and lunch with extra sides. She cuts him off and makes it known to him that she knows that, but she didn't want Jonas to have that sugar confection. And berates Shell for protecting her because she thinks it's because he didn't want his wing to get damaged. She begins to cry while knocking his chest as she acknowledges that she is not capable of using his wing to force him to do her bidding. The girl stops and falls to the floor sobbing as Shell stands there, shortly after it begins to rain, so it makes her way into Jonas's abandoned carriage to find her late mother's confection blueprints scattered all over the place. As she looks at them with a sad expression, Shell interrupts to inform her that Jonas likely intended to enter the exhibition with one of the stolen designs. However, he was not able to make them, so he decided to steal her work and headed to Lewiston to present it as his own. And checks around and sees the sugar that was stolen from her wagon nights ago, Shell continues his exposition stating that it was likely stolen by his servant fairy Kathy since she can turn invisible. Jonas then estimated the amount of silver sugar she used to make her piece and loaded it into her cart in advance and stole the wagon with her finished piece inside. And wonders how Detective Shell knows all of this, he answers saying that he's just aware of human nature. He's surprised when and suddenly returns his wings to him, the exhibition is in two days, and she is certain that Jonas will have already reached Lewiston by now. It's too late for her at this point, Shell wants to know if she is happy with his outcome, she answers no, but there is nothing she can do about it. She has therefore decided to set him free and instructs him to go somewhere else. Shell quietly takes his wing and leaves, and falls to the floor upset that she's alone again and apologizes to her deceased mother that her dream of becoming a sugar master and sending her spirit to the heavens on Pull Soul Day will not be possible. Tears stream from her face as she asks why her mother had to die leaving her alone, she cries herself to sleep. The following morning, she is woken up by a gentle kiss from the sun's rays and makes her way to some blueberries where her gaze manifests a fairy. As she interacts with it, Shell appears from behind to explain that fairies are born when another's gaze causes the energy within an object to condense and take form. The newly born fairy introduces herself as Lissel and Shell informs her of the harsh reality of the world she's been born into. Humans take fairies as their servants and use their wings to control them. He advises her to move somewhere that humans don't inhabit if she wants to be safe. Lissel heeds his advice and leaves, all the while and is surprised to see that he is still around. As she flies away, he tells the fairy that and is a special case, and that is why she was not captured by her. Now that the two are alone, Shell questions her on the expression on her face and what it means. She just wants to know why he's at the camp since she has already returned his wing. He notifies her that she still hasn't kept her promise to him, so he has come to make sure she keeps it. Shell reminds her that she promised to give him a sugar confection. With a tear of joy in her eyes she happily confirms her past statement and vows to make something incredibly beautiful. As she rushes to start, Shell halts her pointing out her appearance and suggests that she shouldn't make sugar confections while this dirty. He provides her with a shirt that he found in the cargo hold, she cleans herself up and changes into it, and sets up her station and begins to work with passion despite not being able to make it to the exhibition. She puts her all into her craft as it is a tribute to Shell who came back to her, she intends to make something that she feels is beautiful. Shell patiently waits till dusk when Anne's call breaks his anticipation, she stands there with a white cloth covering her work. She presents it to him, and he immediately unveils it and is in awe by the beauty of what she made, the sugar confection is modeled from the fairy that came to life from her gaze. She comments on how small it is, but explains that given everything that she has been through, this is her truest sugar confection. He commands her on an excellent job as he accepts her gift, Shell holds it in the sunset as it sparkles just like his wing and is inspired by the beauty of the sight and pleads with Shell to allow her to touch his wing. He lets her for the first time, and she comments on how warm it is as they have a moment, after which he confirms that the sugar confection belongs to him before making his way to the carriage. He alerts her to get on because they are leaving for Lewiston, the fairy Chad lifts her into the carriage when she is too slow. He explains that if they travel through the night, they will arrive in the morning. He wants her to enter the exhibition with the piece she made for him, 
Shell makes a good point that if it's her truest work then it is a piece that deserves to enter. If it isn't good enough then she can accept her defeat more graciously. She is confused as to why he would do something so nice for her. He reveals that she returned his wing so she is no longer his master, and if that's the case then he feels like they can become friends if that's what he wishes. His words come as a surprise to her, and she asks him if that is something that he would want. They smile at each other as Shell jumps on ready to set off, and worries that night is coming and wonders if they will escape the bloody highway safely. The warrior fairy is confident in his ability. The following morning, everybody gathers at the exhibition just before it starts, they wait in anticipation and gossip among themselves trying to predict who will win the royal medal that year. A few school names are thrown around. Meanwhile, Jonas the thief stands there with N's peace as he tries to pass it off as his own. As King Edmund approaches, some guy announces it so that the crowd can appropriately accept him. They start to cheer and applaud as he and his queen prepare to sit down, but the cheers in the crowd start to turn to shouts of warning and panic as N and shall push through the gathering. Just before they reach, the royal army barricades the girl and instructs Shell to stop. He whips it Tokyo Drift style and halts their charge, but they knock over the markers. And quickly hops down with her entry in hand and is happy that the result of the sugar confectionery exhibition has not yet been declared. Jonas looks on in horror to see that she actually made it. As she dashes to make her entry, the guards rightfully stop her advances based on her brazen display. Before the guards takes any further action, Hugh halts them and is impressed with N's entrance. The royal assistant is surprised that Hugh knows her and addresses him by his last name. He confirms that she is a sugar artisan and has ascertained her skills with his own eyes. His verbal acknowledgement is enough to get her to enter because it is revealed that Hugh is the head of the Mercury Workshop School and the current Silver Sugar Viscount. He gives her a cheeky wink for not telling her earlier. Before the judging begins Jonas makes his way over to compliment how nice his clothes look on her. He also takes a shot at how small the size piece is and is impressed that she had the nerve to present it. She has the best comeback and responds that she is impressed by his level of shamelessness to enter someone else's work but he acts oblivious to her accusations. She turns around to see that Shell is there to support her. Downing officially commences the beginning of the exhibition. The artisan with the finest work will be granted the title of Silver Sugar Master. Hugh orders everyone to unveil their creation as the king will now examine the sugar confections. After some observation, Edmund shortlists it down to Anne and Jonas's stolen work as the two finalists. His Majesty steps up for a closer inspection and finds the situation quite strange, so he calls Hugh to give his expert opinion. To the king's eyes, they appear similarly beautiful. The silver sugar viscount notices that they also look like they have been made by the same artisan given how alike they are. These comments make Jonas jolt in fear. Hugh asks the king which one he prefers. He chooses Anne's second submission to Jonas's devastation. The king continues to praise her work stating that he has never seen such a beautiful sugar sculpture. Queen Margaret agrees with her husband's sentiments but she points out that the winning confection will be the centerpiece of the festival so it must be made large and spectacular. Even though in possesses the skills to make this small confection, they are not sure if she will be able to replicate it on a large piece, and based on that, the king decides to give the win to Jonas meaning he will be awarded the royal medal. The thief's face switches to joy upon hearing the news, Downing asks and to step aside while they examine his three barrels of refined silver sugar to make sure his skills are well-rounded in all aspects of the confection process. Jonas gets up and smiles at N before leaving, as he goes to present his sugar the barrel tumbles over. Mithril falls out in a sugar coma from the full barrel he just ate. Downing's shouting wakes him up and he begins to apologize to his majesty. He lies confessing that he's in service to Jonas and how bad his master is at making silver sugar. He explains that he couldn't make the required amount, so he had him use his ability to trick everyone by making the barrel appear full. All the while, and watches on confused as to why Mithril is around, Jonas shuts the fairy up and claims that it is all a conspiracy. He grabs N and reveals that Mithril is in service to her. He accuses her of sabotaging him because she wanted to become a silver sugar master. Mithril comes to her defense proving that they have some affiliation and admits to knowing Mithril but has nothing to do with his eating the sugar. The fairy prompts her to tell the truth, so she pushes Jonas away and reveals that Jonas stole the piece she made and entered it as his own. The two begin to fight, but Hugh has an idea to find the real creator. He suggests that they should both make identical butterflies as the one found on the winning piece. Anne is confident, but Jonas looks terrified. The girl starts making her confection knowing Shell is giving silent support, so she has decided to make a beautiful butterfly that will make him happy. As she works on the wings, she thinks back to when she touched his and tries to replicate it. Hugh stops them before they finish, 
She looks over to Jonas's work and it looks so off-brand that it is obvious that he didn't make what he presented. He tries to blame his poor performance on the environment, claiming he works best alone in a quiet place. The Silver Sugar Viscount cuts him off and calls him a disgrace. Meanwhile, the piece and has produced is closer to what has been presented but Hugh notices that it is also different. The king walks over confused because it is evident who created the work he chose as the winner. The Viscount asks his majesty to choose between the butterflies that and just made and the one presented and he selects ends. Upon closer inspection he notices what Hugh was saying, the king declares it a no contest since they are not sure who made the winning piece and this confuses the crowd, and asks the Viscount why she lost since he knew that the piece was hers, he explains that improving her skill worked against her on this occasion. The butterfly she just made now is her original work and is better than the submission, the complaint brings her to tears, and the queen also asks Downing to tell her that they hope to see her bring a confection worthy of winning the following year. She is grateful for the kind words and promises to come back. Hugh has been given the authority to punish Jonas for his actions and makes her way over to him and orders him to stand up before giving him a brutal slap that sends him flying and squalling like a piglet. Hugh is happy with the slap as punishment and leaves it as that after the festival and finds Shell and thanks him for allowing her to enter using his sugar confection, and is a bit disappointed that she didn't win for her mother, but she will try again the following year. The girl tries to hand it back to him, but he rejects it saying that he wants one made by a silver sugar master. That means that they will travel together till the following year when she enters the exhibition again. Shell unleashes his Giga Chad energy when he pulls her closer as they have a moment, Mithril interrupts stating he too will follow until he repays his debt to her. The story picks up days after the festival and still lingers in Lewiston to visit the Silver Sugar Master shops since there are so many in the city. She gets excited with what she has seen so far and looks at her map to see where the next one is. Shell is fed up at this point and asks if going to all these different shops really will make her improve. She finds his comment very rude and tells him that since they have made the far journey to the city, it is worth visiting all of them. There is just one more that she would like to go see before they set off. When they get there, a local old man informs them that the master she is looking for has moved. The view pans out to show an empty plot because the shop has been physically moved, and is massively disappointed revealing that the shop belongs to Alf Hingley, someone she admires, his skills are said to rival that of the current Silver Sugar Viscount. With nothing left to see, they make their way out of the city to head for Westall, but she worries that the place might be too cold for her. Mithril comments that if she can't deal with it then it's best to go elsewhere, and explains that she can't do that because she's not a sugar master yet so no one will take notice of her in the other areas, but since Westall is a less desirable place for sugar artisans she might have a better chance to make an impact and hone her skills. As they begin to leave the city limits, and is surprised to see a sugar confectionery in such an area. She even comments that it doesn't have the traditional look of one, nevertheless, she decides to go inside to have a look. When she enters, the girl is mesmerized by a sugar sculpture sitting on the table, she wonders who could have made something so beautiful. Mithril spots Fairy Benjamin nearby, but after interacting with him he realizes that he's very easygoing. He has not panicked at their presence, while En's attention is on them, the sculpture begins to move from her field of view. She looks over to see a hooded man in all black trying to steal the work. There is a short pause as they both try to process what is going on. En shouts Thief, which panics the robber, so he trips as he frantically tries to escape with the sculpture, but he drops it in the process and runs out past Shell. The owner of the shop named Cat comes out when he hears the commotion and immediately begins to accuse En since she's the only one around. This annoys Mithril who jumps to his friend's defense informing Cat that the culprit just left. He asks Benjamin if it's true, but the fairy is so laid back that he's not able to give a compelling statement. Mithril describes the perpetrator as dressed in all black just as Shell comes in to find out what all the noise is about. Benjamin comments that the person in all black was just like the warrior fairy, Cat thinks that he's the perpetrator, but incorrects him that Shell is a travel companion that just came in to check the situation. The shop owner gets in En's face and recognizes her as the girl who caused the commotion at the festival. When she confirms this, he decides to have her work off her debt for breaking the sculpture. Shell tries to drag her away but Cat stops him which almost leads to a confrontation. En calms everyone down when she decides to work even though she didn't commit the crime. The girl sees this as a good opportunity to learn how he made such a beautiful piece. With the deal struck, and gets straight to work processing and refining the sugar needed to remake the piece, 
Cad later discloses that the sugar confection needs to be completed in the next two days. Anne is not happy that he calls her a kid and he too doesn't like that she's making fun of his name calling him Mr. Cat. He already doesn't like the nickname everyone gave him and her adding Mr. makes it so much worse. Everyone knows him by his nickname instead of his real one. The girl is a little shocked when she hears how cheaply he charges to make confection for his current client, but he explains that he selects who he makes it for and not all of them can pay the high price. After a day of work, they check their remaining sugar, and it seems to be low, but Kat feels like it should be enough for them to work with. Anne goes to bed, but can't sleep as she thinks about the amount left, so she goes out in the cold to prepare more sugar. Shell comes to help her by warming her cold fingers. She works through the night to make sure that there is surplus sugar for them to work with. The following morning, Kat wakes up to more sugar and is impressed that she went the extra mile. After they take breakfast, they get back to work but the artisans are interrupted by a rich old lady who comes to confront Cat after hearing that he's making a piece for the cobbler's daughter. She offers 100 crests for him to make one for her daughter, but this annoys the shop owner because he has already informed her that he will never make anything for her. The old lady and her daughter treat their servants badly. Cat has even made pieces for these servants in the past but will not do so for the masters. Just as the old lady is about to leave, she stops when she sees Shell and she is infatuated by his beauty, so offers to pay for him but N sternly alerts her that Shell is a free fairy so is not for sale. She also asks her to leave and as she does so, and recognizes the scar on one of her servant's faces and IDs him as the one who tried to steal Kat's work. The girl internally promises that she will not allow the old hag to get hold of Kat's work. That evening, they finally finish the work and it's just as magnificent as the first one. The animators were happy with this scene as it was just a copy and paste job. Kat wants her to deliver it the following day as a reward for her hard work. She will get to see the joy and happiness on the person's face when they receive it, there are lessons in experiencing that moment too. Later that night, the thief comes back again to take the covered sculpture. As he picks it up and tries to escape, everyone emerges. This causes Butterfingers to panic making him fall and drop the work yet again. Cat screams as he thinks that the culprit has done the same thing as the last time, but he's surprised to see Sticks and the two fairies inside when it crashes the wall. Mithril and Benjamin complain about feeling dizzy from the fall the next morning during breakfast and discloses that she took the masterpiece to the client earlier knowing that the thief will return. With her debt paid, the girl prepares to leave for Westholt so Kat gives her a beautiful coat to protect her from the cold. Benjamin removes his wing from the inside because Kat doesn't have an interest in keeping it to control his helper. The fairy could escape but has decided to stay because his master is very good to him. Just as Anne is about to set off, it is revealed that Kat is off Hingley and he was colleagues with Hugh when they were learning the job. She expresses how much she admires him but he advises her to see herself as number one instead of placing people above her. She says her farewells and after a short journey, she arrives at Westall, where it is colder and more difficult to get her work noticed than she anticipated. Meanwhile, at a castle in the area, Sugar Viscount Hugh presents a beautiful piece of the three founding families of the kingdom. It's made by one of his most skilled artisans and Downing loves it. But the Sugar Viscount is a little bit unsure if this is the appropriate theme given that it's a gift for his granddaughter's wedding. But Downing is sure because the young must know the history they are inheriting so that they can carry it forward. The topic of Inn comes up and Hugh reveals that he met her in Westall Town a few days prior and he offered her a place at his school but she refused and preferred to navigate through the challenges on her own but thanked him for the offer. They begin to discuss more serious matters because Downing must head back to Lewiston to have a meeting with the king regarding the Duke of Phylax. As stated, the kingdom's founding father left behind three family lines which are the Millsland, Chamber, and Alban Houses. The Millsland are the successors to the throne, the current King Edmund was twelve when he became king. The Chamber House caused an uprising in an attempt to usurp the throne, but Lord Downing suppressed the rebellion. He eradicated the ringleaders and his house Auburn was also involved, Downing took their lands and dismantled their military. They are not under direct royal control in the phylax. They must give their revenue and the head of the house must visit the royal family every month to show they are still loyal. Hugh has met the current young leader of the Auburn House and doesn't think that he has any of those ambitions or sinister connections. The young man is intelligent and gentle but from his past experiences, Downing is still wary of them and suspects something is amiss. All the while, Anne and her fairy companions sit at the eatery to get food, 
They start a conversation with the owner. She tells them that Westall is rather a difficult place for an upcoming sugar artisan to go to establish themselves. Since the area is under the care of the Silver Sugar Viscount, the customers there have a good eye and they don't deal with outside sugar artisans. Anne is impressed with the knowledgeable lady and now understands why she has not had any customers yet. Some of the customers start to complain about Anne eating with her fairies, but the owner puts them all in their place. To help with her customer problem, she informs Anne of the port city of Phylax and how Duke William Alban is looking for a sugar artisan regardless of their status. The prospect stays at the castle to make various sugar confections and if he likes the peas he will pay a thousand crests as a reward. This gets Anne excited. The owner also adds that if she gets acknowledgement from such a high profile individual, it will give her prestige as a sugar artisan which she can leverage that will get the customers lining up. And quickly makes her way to the port town and goes straight to the castle to present her sugar confection. She is directed to a hall where another artisan waits to also present their work. William enters and inspects their work. He keeps in but dismisses the other guy. He questions Anne on why she picked a fairy to showcase. She gives an answer stating that it depicts a friend of hers she wanted to give it to, but he rejected it because he didn't want to eat himself. He is satisfied with her answer and offers her a place to stay at the castle for the next test. He reveals a portrait of an elegant looking fairy and asks her to make a sugar confection that captures her essence. Anne comments on her beauty and is happy to produce something based on it. The duke alerts her that there are more portraits of the fairy at a different part of the castle so she should go there to look at them for more information. As he leaves, the Duke asks Dale to show her to the workshop. The servant praises Anne for showcasing her love for fairies because the Duke agrees with her mindset. She arrives at the lodges and workshop to find that Shal and Mithril are already there. Dale informs her that there are three artisans from the Radcliffe School also looking to impress the Duke. He just hopes they all behave themselves. Later on, Shal and Anne decide to go to the area to inspect the portraits, and to her surprise, Jonas is one of the three also competing for the job. Jonas has been telling lies about Anne regarding the exhibition incident, so his colleagues prepare to attack the girl but shall deters them when he activates his sword. With that extra incentive, Anne quickly gets to work and makes her beautiful rendition of the portrait. She goes out to wash her face and has a moment with Shell. They are interrupted by Jonas who boasts about how well his presentation went before leaving. The following day, Anne shows her work off and the Duke is impressed enough to allow her to stay a little longer at the castle. It is revealed that Jonas was also chosen to work at the castle. As Dale shows her to her long-term residence, Jonas is surprised to see her and they make their declaration that they will not lose to each other. The days go by and Anne works on the commission piece when she hears Jonas's signal which indicates to Duke William that he has finished his work. This puzzles her because he rang it the previous night. She focuses on hers and finishes it that evening. She rings her bell for him to inspect her piece. However, she is shocked that William is frustrated that they don't understand what he's looking for, so he orders her to give her confectionery more form. She returns to study the portrait and tries to make it more realistic. Once finished, Anne goes to look at the painting more to make sure she has done it justice. On her way down, she meets Jonas who has a mark on his face and is in a state of distress as he informs Anne that he has given up. He tells her that she will feel the same way soon enough. She dismisses his warning and presents her latest attempt to the Duke, but it just enrages him to the point that he smashes it. He distributes the same instruction to give it form. His actions make Anne sad, but she refuses to give up. That night, Anne is brought to tears when she has a conversation about Liz with Shell. She runs off embarrassed which confuses the warrior fairy. She calms down and returns, but Shell is nowhere to be found, although Jonas seems to have infiltrated her room. He calls Anne and reveals that he has taken Mithril's wing and squeezes it to prove his point. Jonas instructs Anne to dismiss Shell from her side with the condition that he's never to appear before her again. She follows the instructions when the fairy arrives from his night stroll he doesn't argue against her words and leaves. Jonas commends her while she cries. Mithril feels bad because he knows that Anne loves Shell. The following day, Shell deals with some fairy hunters who try to apprehend him on the road, but Hugh interjects before he finishes them off. He reveals that he has business with the Duke. All the while, Jonas takes Anne to meet William where he pleads for permission to let him quit. The guy sacrifices Anne promising that she will stay to complete the work. That is why he wanted Shell out of the picture. The Duke's reaction indicates that he was the one who gave Jonas those injuries. Anne can see that Jonas is defeated and promises to the Duke that she will make the sugar confection. He warns her that she will never be allowed to leave the castle if she fails. Anne agrees to it so he allows Jonas to go. The guy is surprised that she was so willing. Anne takes shots at him when she 
she says that she doesn't give up halfway through doing things, she asks for Mithril's wing before he leaves. All the while, Shell explains his situation to Hugh who reveals that he's heading to the castle. The Duke hasn't paid his monthly respects to the King for over a year, they have taken it as an act of war, so Dowling has mobilized an army to subjugate William. Hugh wishes to go reason with him since they have been friendly before he became the Silver Sugar Viscount. He presents himself and pleads with William to join him on a trip to Lewiston, Hugh even suggests that Lady Christina accompany him. This triggers the Duke who threatens and dismisses the Viscount. During that interim, and looks at the portrait again trying to figure out what is missing, the sun shines on it and under this new light, she realizes that the fairy portrait had two wings and had never been made to serve anyone. She decides to ask the Duke more about her which worries Mithril because the Duke is not mentally stable, and asks him to also leave the castle assuring him that she will be fine and will find him when she has finished the sugar confection. Mithril decides to find Shell and explain the situation to him and why Anne dismissed him. With this new lead, she requests a meeting with the Duke, where she asks for more information about the fairy portrayed. Before giving details, he warns her that it is a touchy topic for him so if he opens these old wounds and she's not able to produce the piece, she will be ended. Anne accepts the risk, so the Duke begins to give details revealing her name to be Christina, she disappeared a year ago. From the way he talks about her, she can see that William loved her, which moves her, so she pleads to bring her workshop to his room to work while they discuss. Meanwhile, Hugh talks about how Christina soothed William's anger at the way the Crown treats his family for their past betrayal. Their conversation is halted when Selim reports the appearance of the army, they soon arrive at Downing's camp who is not surprised that Hugh's persuasions didn't work. He intends to deal with this spark of rebellion once and for all, the Viscount points out Anne's presence in the castle, but it doesn't dissuade Downing. Outside, Shal's worries are interrupted by Selim who brings a captured Mithril who explains the situation. Shal takes off immediately to Anne's side during that moment, word reaches the Duke of the Army outside. Anne overhears and tries to give her opinion on this issue between nobles, but William tells her to zip it and instructs her to carry on with her work. Shell soon joins her and they have a moment before he tries to evacuate her, but she is determined to continue her life-size work of Christina. She finishes the piece, but the eyes are not correct, Shell heads down to hold off the soldiers while she rectifies it using William's description. The complete work brings the Duke to tears who informs Anne of her achievement in capturing Christina's essence, he gives her payment and finally surrenders. Anne later finds out that her sugar confection put the Duke in a calm state which aided in the resolution of the issue, Williams will be living under Downing's supervision. A year passes after that incident and Anne has been traveling and selling her work at various villages and towns. She decides to head back to Lewiston to prepare for the exhibition when she bumps into Cat. He berates her carelessness before they head to the local tavern. They have both noticed the state of the sugar apple trees and it doesn't look like it is going to be a good harvest. To avoid chaos, Hugh has forbidden individuals from harvesting and refining sugar apples. It will all be harvested in the name of the Silver Sugar Viscount and refined. Only sugar artisans who participate in the process will be allotted silver sugar for their labor. The Radcliffe School has the monopoly of executing the work so all the other schools and artisans have gathered at the workshop to help in the refining process. There is no other way to obtain sugar currently, and hasn't heard about this, the information was supposed to be passed on to the wandering artisans, but Redcliffe School deliberately failed to do so. Shell disclosed that Anne has been harassed by them everywhere she went. Cat believes that it is because she gained the Duke's seal of approval for her work. The others are jealous, so they are ostracizing her. She's more interested to know what she has to do to enter the confectionery exhibition. He reveals that those who wish to enter must temporarily reside at the main Radcliffe workshop. They will be allotted sugar apples as a reward for their work. They are to use these apples to to refine silver sugar which they will use to make their pieces. Due to the nature of the job, artisans will only have the night to work on their submissions. Because of this, many arrived at the workshop two weeks ago and is escorted there by Cat. They receive hostile treatment from Jonas and Sammy who refuse to let a lady into their workshop, especially in as they have heard of her exploits. Shell prepares to attack Sammy but Keith interjects and scolds Sammy for his behavior. He welcomes Anne to the workshop and shows her to her room. Shell is allowed to stay because Keith wants to use him as his subject for his exhibition piece. It is later revealed that Keith knew Anne's mother. Since his father was the late former Silver Sugar Viscount, he had the opportunity to meet many different artisans. After their dialogue, he gets permission from Shell so they head to his workshop. 
Keith reveals the fact that this might be Anne's last chance to become a Silver Sugar Master. She has drawn too much attention due to her accolades over the past year. The jealous artisans will never allow her to obtain sugar apples again. This year's issues have worked in her favor since the harvesting is done by a third party. Keith pleads to Shell not to inform her as he wants her to compete without this pressure holding her back. The following day they are shown the setup for refining the large batches of sugar apple and the work seems serious. All the men in the shop give in a scolding look as they believe she is not supposed to be in there. Kat explains an ancient story of how the human woman fell in love with the fairy king betraying her kind. Their ancestor King Cedric launched a campaign and defeated the fairies freeing mankind from the fairies. She is shocked to hear that is what is being taught in the church. However, Kat feels like their hostility is more due to the fact they think she is going to hinder their work due to it being physically demanding. The head of the school Marcus enters the shop. He interacts with Kat informing him that he's to oversee the refining with Elliot who is the acting head of the page school. His attention turns to Anne and reminds her that she will have to work to receive sugar apples, but he's concerned because the utensils are very heavy. But Anne is up to the task. Marcus also lets Jonas know that if he loses to Anne again, Keith will be the one to take over the shop. Anne quickly gets changed ready to work, but she struggles with the manual labor. Elliot takes her away introducing himself as an ally of all women. He feels like she should do less strenuous work. Kat spots them and begins to slate him for coming late. Elliot came with his fiancée Bridget, daughter of Glenn Page. She has come to help around the kitchen. She leaves after watching Anne struggle with the job. After a hard day's work, Bridget helps serve the artisans. She questions Anne as to why she has three plates. Her need is justified when Shell, Keith, and Mithril join. Bridget is smitten by Shell but is unable to say anything as they quickly leave. Later, Jonas informs Anne that Marcus has given her a batch of apples to use for her work. The girl excitedly goes there to check her apples and ends up sleeping there. Shell traces her. He sends her back to bed before going out to fetch water for her when he's met by Bridget who assumes that Anne owns him and offers to buy Shell promising to give him a better life, but he rejects her. Six days later, and Anne is in the full swing of work. She has an altercation with Sammy regarding the refining. Keith pulls her to the side to calm her down. He tries to take her mind off it by showing her his completed exhibition piece and she is impressed by it. Keith is happy to hear the positive feedback. She makes her way to the window wondering what she's going to make. Anne spots Shell meeting Bridget and sees her hugging him. The lady confesses her love to Shell but Anne looks away just before he rejects her. Keith can see that Anne is upset and takes her hand as they run across the yard together. Shell catches the interaction with his two eyeballs and is a little salty about it. One evening, Anne bumps into Jonas who expresses his disdain for her but she's more concerned about Shell who has been modeling for Keith intensely for the past week. Anne is also interested in learning why the royal family favors sugar confections of fairies. On her day off, she heads to the church to learn about this story in order to gain inspiration for her exhibition piece. Shell accompanies her, but they are both a bit distant after witnessing each other getting friendly with other people. Anne brings up his embrace with Bridget and she's surprised to hear that he doesn't even know her name. Shell explains how she wanted to buy him, but he rejected her and told her that she would have to steal his wing if she wanted him. Hearing this makes Anne happy, but Shell is salty about her little moment with Keith. They arrive at the church, but they are not able to access the library as it is under renovation. There is a mural on the church's ceiling that is writing in ancient Hylanean. Shell reveals that he can read it and begins to narrate the true story between the fairy king and Cedric. They were friends and wanted to create a world where humans and fairies live together in harmony, but war broke out and the fairies lost and became subjected. Cedric loathed the outcome as history was rewritten to what the church propagates now. The royal family still carries Cedric's sorrow which is why they favor sugar confections of fairies. After hearing the story, Anne is also inspired when she sees Shao's wings glittering in the sunlight. She heads back to the workshop and commences her work. All the while, Kat warns Shell that Bridget is obsessed with him. She can even be heard arguing with Elliot to acquire him, but he's not afraid of her. As the days go on, Anne continues to work till she finishes her piece just two days before the exhibition. Marcus has caught wind and has come to inspect it to make sure it is by the exhibition regulations. Keith pleads to join them during the inspection. She leads them to her room where she catches Mithril trying to get a taste of her processed sugar. As she confronts him, Sammy notices the quality of the sugar, and Marcus Marcus reminds her why they came. She apologizes and reveals her work. They are all stunned by its beauty. As they head back, Sammy overhears Keith being intimidated by Anne's work. That evening, 
he sends an oblivious Jonas to lure her out under the pretense of Marcus wanting to meet her. Sammy and his boys see in as a threat to Keith, so they capture her and try to end her career by putting her hand in molten sugar. Although Jonas dislikes in, he feels like this is too far so he escapes to tell Shell. The warrior fairy saves her causing Sammy and his boys to flee. Later, Marcus hears about the incident and comes to apologize. It is revealed that Sammy reported Jonas as the perpetrator. He expels Jonas and Anne when she tries to explain that Sammy was rather the culprit. The following day, Anne leaves that workshop, but Keith and Kat promise to expose Sammy. Bridget watches on with a sad expression as Shell leaves. Anne later thanks Jonas for saving her, but he informs her that he only did it because he was scared. However, he still hates her. The night before the exhibition, Mithril checks and sugar and realizes that it has been switched with the mass-produced sugar. Shell orders him to keep it a secret from Anne and to tell her a lie about his absence. He heads back to the workshop where Anne's allies gather to figure out who took it. Bridget confesses that she knows what happened to Anne's sugar, but she has no intention of telling them. By this time, it is the following day and the exhibition is on the way. Keith is surprised to see Anne in good spirits which confuses him. Hugh interrupts them to reveal the letter stating that Anne stole the mass-produced sugar to pass as her own. They bring her barrels out and she is devastated to see that her sugar has been switched. All the while, Bridget reveals that she wants Shao's wing in exchange for the information, so he gives it without hesitation. She even orders him to kiss her when Elliot leaves the room. The Back at the exhibition, the crowd calls for her disqualification, but Kat and the innkeeper points out that an artisan of Inn's class should be able to make her silver sugar. The commotion is quelled when the king and queen arrive. After hearing the issue, they have no other option but to disqualify her. Anne apologizes for causing a commotion again, but they ask her to reveal her piece, and everyone's eyes pop out when they see it. Her work is of Shao Swing elegantly covering the kingdom's coat of arms. Anne remembers that fairies can identify differences in sugar. She breaks off a piece of her work to be tasted by the king's fairy who is trusted. He reports that Anne's work is made from a very high quality silver sugar. He tastes her barrel and points out the difference. Simultaneously, Bridget arrives and reveals that it was Sammy who took in sugar. They bring his barrel out and Clifford confirms it to be the same as N's sculpture. Sammy breaks down and starts to cry that he is sorry. Marcus is livid and can't believe this. He apologizes on his pupil's behalf before being dismissed by the king. Anne is allowed back into the exhibition and wins the royal medal which officially makes her a silver sugar master. The king presents it to her and in the aftermath, Shell hugs and congratulates her. He says goodbye which confuses Anne. Keith reveals that Shell sold himself to Bridget to get the information. She tries to stop him from leaving, but her path is blocked, and by the time it clears, Shell is gone. She collapses in despair. Cat and Keith get a little physical with Elliot for allowing Shell to lose his wings. He points out that N's silver sugar was returned which was the objective in the first place. He states that his fiancée Bridget and Shell negotiated among themselves in his absence. All the while, N sadly stares at the royal medal wondering why Shell sacrificed so much for her. She believes that even if she couldn't win, she could have always tried the following year. Keith interjects with an apology before disclosing that he told Shell that this year's exhibition was N's last chance to become a sugar master because the other school's jealousy of her achievements would have made it difficult for her to harvest the sugar apples in later years. Hearing this plunges her into despair, but Mithril tries to snap her out of it suggesting that she rushes to the workshop immediately and talk to Bridget. Keith agrees and assures her that everything will be fine because they are going to be with her. Elliot reigns on their parade when he informs them that she is not there but has gone back to the main page workshop at Millsfield. They just received a letter informing them that Bridget's father is not feeling well. He is the master of the page school. Elliot will be setting off now that his work has finished in the capital. He is also concerned about Glenn's health. He offers Anne to come along with him and work at their workshop as a silver sugar master. With her around, he might be able to create an opportunity for her to get Shell back. Keith immediately steps in and questions Elliot about his intentions. Mithril suspects that he's plotting something. He rejects such accusations saying that he's simply being nice. Elliot advises Anne that if she takes the job, she will be affiliating herself with the page school. She pauses for a moment before agreeing to go. Keith pleads for her not to make such a decision rashly because it is obvious that there is a hidden angle that might put her at a disadvantage. After hearing him out, she still decides to go as she has the desire to be wherever Shell is. Her determination makes Elliot happy. That night, Anne packs the last of her belongings for the journey. She informs Mithril that she wants to save Shell and set him free again. The fairy goes to get their dinner leaving her to her thoughts. 
she feels like the medal was given to her by Shell. Hugh interrupts and informs her that Kat came to visit him which is unusual because the guy doesn't like him. He asked Hugh to use his authority as the Silver Sugar Viscount to get Shell back. He feels responsible for what transpired since he was the one in charge of Silver Sugar manufacturing. and doesn't feel like he's at fault and pleads for Hugh not to get involved, Although she is grateful for Kat's feelings, she wants to atone for her lapse herself and free Shell with her strength. If she doesn't, she will not be able to proudly declare herself a Silver Sugar Master. Hugh knew she would reject using such means to get Shell back, the Viscount reveals he had a bet with Kat who thought otherwise. Now that he has won, Kat will have to do anything he says, messing with him is a hobby of his since they first met. Hugh only warns her to establish her position as a Silver Sugar Master otherwise, people will say that her royal medal was a fluke. Since she is a woman, the eyes of the world are harsh, but he too feels like her freeing shell is the first step to calling herself a Silver Sugar Master. The following day, she sets off with Elliot with the full intention of achieving her objective. On the other hand, Elliot is happy that he gets to travel with such nice company, he asks Anne if Shell is her sweetheart. She denies this while blushing, so Elliot teases her that he finds it heartbreaking that it is a case of one-sided love on her part. Shortly after they arrive, Elliot points out that all the buildings in the area she sees are part of the main page workshop. She explores the stables when she's confronted by Orland who wants to know who she is. Elliot comes and explains that that is in, a silver sugar master he scouted in Lewiston. She will be working with them starting the next day so he should play nice. Orland is puzzled to hear that she is a master and turns away with some kind of attitude. Elliot informs Anne that Orland is currently head of artisans and commends his skill, they are the same age, but the head has a difficult personality. The two go to the main building where she is introduced to a bedroom in Glen looking like a washed out unseasoned Escanor. Bridget stands next to the bed and scowls at Inn. Glen introduces himself and his role at the workshop, he apologizes for meeting her in his current state and reveals that he has an illness of the heart. He is impressed that she obtained the royal medal, and a little shocked that a master like her would want to work with the smallest school. He is sure that this is about the fairy that Bridget brought back with her. Anne confirms this, but Glenn wants to know if she would give her best if she was to work at the school. She assures him that she never cuts corners in her work, so she will use her full abilities. After hearing this, Glenn gives her the job, but Bridget asks her father if he is serious because he told her that a girl couldn't be a sugar artisan when she wanted to be one. He explains that her position as the daughter of the master of a school makes it impossible and that is a truth that will not change. She steps back into submission after her father's speech and is surprised to learn that Bridget wants to be a sugar artisan. Glenn apologizes for the disruption and appoints her as head of artisans. She will be taking responsibility for overseeing all the work at the shop. Ordinarily, it should be Elliot's job, but he's currently Glenn representative in matters concerning the school. She worries how Orland would take it but the head of the school points out that Orland is not a sugar master so it would be unthinkable for her to work under regular artisans. She doesn't feel experienced enough for the job, but Glenn lets her know that the fact that she has that medal is a testament that she can do it and running away from her duty means that she has no right to the royal medal. She gathers herself and accepts the job, Glenn lets her know that he has high hopes for her. Elliot's description of her work is akin to the first silver of sugar, he informs her that Elliot will tell her the meaning when the time is right. As for Shell, he intends to give him back if she works to his expectation, hearing this makes Anne happy, but Bridget falls into protest. Washed out Escanor reminds her of her place to one day marry Elliot and inherit the school, which means Shell is completely out of the picture for her. Elliot also lets her know that he will not allow this, and Bridget storms out of the room upset. Glenn apologizes to Elliot for his daughter's behavior, all the while, Bridget enters her room and smashes some items in frustration that no one cares how she feels. Anne gives Mithril a rundown of the meeting and is happy to hear the good news. Elliot confesses that he used this opportunity to get in to come because he hopes that her presence might change the situation as things are difficult for the workshop in many ways. She wants to know if it is linked to the first silver of Sugar Glen mentioned. He doesn't answer but his line of questioning is why he has high hopes for her. Back inside, Bridget continues her meltdown and orders Shell to never for any reason see in, she threatens to punish him if he does. She demonstrates this by squeezing his wings which causes Shell pain, she stops and hugs him apologizing for hurting him. Anne has a look of worry as she watches their interaction, Elliot later shows her the workshop she will be working out of. She is surprised to hear that there are only five artisans and no apprentice, this is why Elliot has high hopes that she can help rebuild the workshop. Later that night, Anne goes to the workshop where she is joined by Shell, 
he wants to know why she came. She informs him of her intention to set him free so that she can proudly state that she is a silver sugar master. After hearing her conviction, he promises to wait for her to save him before hugging her. The following morning, N wakes Mithril up to inform him that she met Shell the previous night and he gets up with excitement. They both look forward to her first day of rebuilding the workshop. She meets three males outside and they have a look of confusion on their faces as they wonder who she is. Elliot joins them and explains that Anne is their new head of artisans. They are impressed when they hear her accomplishments and wonder why someone as amazing as her would work at their workshop. The fact that she is a female is also a talking point. They have no objections when they find out that Glenn is aware of this arrangement. King introduces himself and gets a little nervous when she offers to shake his hand. Nadir goes next and finally Valentine. Orland is the last to arrive making the fifth artisan that Elliot was alluding to. Elliot reminds her that they are counting on her, but she doesn't even know that she has taken responsibility for it. The four artisans make their way to the workshop where Anne asks them to continue with their work from the previous day. She stops at Orland station first and is impressed with the stallion confection. She questions him on the commission and asks if the client likes horses. He doesn't know because he offered them several ideas and they chose the horse. Orland informs her that the shop's ethos is to make what their clients want, otherwise, final product will not be good. Living up to the customer's wishes is the obvious thing to do for commission work. She moves to King's Station next and loves the color he has displayed in his work. He gets startled and tells his boss that she is a little close. She takes a giant step back and apologizes. Nadir teases him leading in to suspect that King is not comfortable around women. Valentine calls her over to alert her that he has finished maintenance on the tools and wonders what he should do next. She asks Orland if there are any pending orders and he informs her that there are none, she asks him to help one of them with their work. Valentine discloses that he can't interfere with another's work, this is alien to her because in a workshop, it is natural for everyone to help. Valentine points out that as artisans, they take responsibility for the work they do, she wonders what the job of the head of artisans is. Orlin tells her that she is to manage the silver sugar, deal with clients, and ascertain whether the sugar confections produced will shame the page workshop while also indicating any corrections. He lets her know that it is a tremendous responsibility. If she green lights the piece, it goes to Master Glenn to receive the seal of the workshop. Anne notices that their procedures are so different from other workshops and from the way she does things. After a long first day, she takes dinner and tries to be friendly to the twin servant fairies. She is soon joined by Elliot who wants to know her opinions. She starts by saying she has learned a lot of things about this place and outlines the methods of the workshop. Elliot reveals that these have been the convictions of the Page School for 300 years. Glenn has made sure that these ideas have been drilled into the artisans and thinks that they are perfectly ideal but it doesn't resonate with her. Since he brought her to the shop, he brings out a giant pile of debts amounting to 10,000 crests with the workshop land placed as collateral. This shocks her. Elliot explains that things have been tight since the previous master's time and if they can't repay it within the year, half of the land will be taken away. Currently, they don't have the means to pay it which is why he went to try and negotiate again. He wants her to keep this negotiation a secret from Glenn. He knows about the debt, but not that they are unable to make repayments. The lenders are worried about the future of the workshop given Mr. Glenn's illness. He admits that he feels the same nagging feeling as N about the way things are currently run. They don't want to turn their back on Glenn, but things are not going well at all, and Elliot can't figure out what it is. He's confident that he will handle the debt somehow and encourages Anne to do things the way she feels is right just like the first Silver Sugar Master. This statement confuses her and she wants to know its meaning, but Elliot just does his creepy smile. Meanwhile, Bridget locks herself in the room wanting to be alone with Shell. He notes that her face seems so lonely, she assures him that she is not alone and orders him to lift her to his bed. She tells him to stay by her side till she falls asleep. As the sun comes up, Shell goes out to get some fresh air when he notices Anne going to the workshop early. He joins her as she admires Orland and the King's work. It is evident that they are talented but she wonders why commissions have declined so much. Bridget barges into the workshop livid after waking up to find Shell gone. Shell lets her know that he has no intention of following her orders so she should punish him. She calls his bluff and runs to her room to crush his wing but Anne chases after her pleading for her not to do it. Bridget finds that the wing has been removed from her secret hiding place and starts to cry. Elliot informs her that it is with her father. Glenn comes in and reveals that someone placed the wing by his pillow. He will look after the wing for now because the way she has been treating Shell has not been good. She storms off annoyed. With Glenn as his new master he gives Shell more freedom telling him not to respond to her every demand but he shouldn't do anything that would hurt her. Later, 
Marcus and Keith pay Glenn a visit. The two heads discuss how the Page School will not be participating in this election for the Holy Beginnings Festival. Glenn reveals that his father rejected it so he will keep that tradition. Anne and Keith excuse themselves for the heads to talk, so they take a walk around the place. He discloses that every year of the Festival of the Holy Beginning, sugar confections are set in the church. Sample models of those are created in advance and the priest decides which workshop will be given the contract. It is a great honor to be chosen and the successful delivery of the pieces from the workshop is rewarded with 10,000 crests. The school also becomes popular which increases commission and screams with excitement because entering this can solve all the school's problems in one swoop. Valentine and Nadir give Keith the cold shoulder when they realize he's Powell's son he explains to Anne that they see him as a traitor. His father was the previous Silver Sugar Viscount and was with the Page Workshop. When he passed on, Keith decided to join another school to build his legacy, but others assumed that he didn't think the Page Workshop was up to standard, so they also left which affected the school. Anne doesn't believe it's his fault that the workshop ended up this way. She feels like the others will see that when things calm down. He thanks her for the words of encouragement but their conversation is truncated when Marcus calls and tells Keith that they must move. He understands because there is only half a month left until the election. She later pitches the idea to Glenn that they should enter this year, as it is an excellent opportunity to bring things back to the old days. But Glenn interrupts her and gives a hard no stating that they will not participate. That brings the episode to an end. His response confuses her as this is an excellent opportunity to rebuild the workshop he simply tells her that he's respecting the will of the previous master. They were the ones who created sugar confections for the Holy Beginnings Festival. However, the previous monarch changed the policies around them to include a selection process. Since then, they were not chosen so the last master decided to stop participating feeling that the royal family and the kingdom's religion looked down on the page workshop. He ends the conversation when and tries to pry further. She leaves and bursts back into the room to inform Glenn that the past master might have been mistaken in some of their decisions. This offends the old man who even goes as far as to accuse her of insulting the workshop, but she stands firm on her opinion as a silver sugar master. Her determination causes Elliot to laugh, and the guy apologizes for his outburst as he escorts and out. He sits her down and is surprised that she was able to defy Glenn. He reveals that everyone at the workshop either feels a deep admiration or a debt of gratitude towards Mr. Glenn. The rest of the artisans join them to confess their love for Glenn as he has helped them all in their time of need. And listens attentively and tries to figure out a way to understand everyone properly, she gets a hint from Mithril that sugar confections might be away. The following day at the workshop, she allows Orlin and King to finish their commissions. She wants to see Nadir and Valentine's skills so she instructs them to make something from the sugar presented. After some hours of work, they presented their finished pieces, and she was amazed by the unique skill set Valentine and Nadir possess. Their exhibition is interrupted by Glenn, he assures them that he's fine when they start to worry. The head admits that the scent of silver sugar that fills the workshop lifts his spirits, and he gets straight to the point by informing them he will allow them to participate in the Holy Beginnings Festival selection process just once. If they are not selected, they will never participate again, and will also have to leave the workshop and Shell will belong to him forever. She agrees to the conditions and later informs Shell who is confident in her abilities. After some deliberation on what to make, they decide to learn about the true history of the school through the previous masters. While the other study and tries to enlist the help of Bridget by first offering her sugar confection, the lady hides her awe at the beauty of the piece and rejects the gesture while also refusing to help. The following day, everyone gathers again with renewed viewpoint from their research about their school. They all want to save the workshop and help Master Glenn get his hope back so they decide to make their piece based on snow since it's a motif that their master likes. Their meeting ends abruptly when they hear a frantic call for help. They rush out to meet Elliot unconscious and leaking that natural ketchup. They quickly rush him inside and tend to his wounds till he regains consciousness. Bridget lingers outside and is happy to see her fiancé fine but she runs off when he tries to interact with her. Elliot informs Shell that his attacker was someone wearing a hood but he's not sure if it was an attempted robbery because the perpetrator commented on the silver sugar smell on him and wanted to know if he was a silver sugar master. They only started to attack when he told them that he wasn't. Shell summoned his blade to determine if the attacker used such a weapon. They are shocked to learn he's a warrior fairy. Elliot confirms that the shine was similar but the metal had reddish silver light, but he couldn't make out its form. Shell concludes that the attacker was a fairy. Everyone is surprised to hear this, 
but Elliot is more concerned about the team missing the deadline for the selection, so he insists they get back to work. She updates Glenn on the situation and heads back to the workshop to suggest they make snow crystals. Everyone makes their unique crystals, and it is agreed that they will combine them to make a snow tower. With the plan finalized, they work hard as a team to complete their submission pieces, Glenn comes to inspect it and loves its beauty and radiance. He gives his full blessing for Anne to represent the school as its head of artisans during the selection at Lewiston. He orders Shell to escort them since the attacker could strike again. They are joined by a recovered Elliot and are attacked by the red-haired culprit that night. While on the road, Shell holds him off to allow Anne and the rest to proceed. The attacker is also a fairy made from a precious stone and tells Shell that he has no master. He even offers to free Shell so that they can work together. He reveals that he wants the sugar confection the team made as well as a silver sugar master. Shell rejects his offers which leads to the continuation of their fight. Things fast forward to the following morning when they arrive at the selection just in time. All the applicants line up and other schools unveil impressive pieces to the church. The page workshop is the last to show their work. Anne uncovers it, however, it doesn't shine like it did at the workshop causing the priests to mutter among themselves since the work is underwhelming. She figures that it's because of a lack of light when she sees an injured shell, and pleads for them to light the candles in the church which allows their work to come to life which amazes everyone. The page workshop is officially given the honor of decorating the church for the festival. Elliot gives Shell's wing back to Anne for her accomplishment, Glenn instructed him to do so if they are chosen. She rushes to check on Shell and gives him back his wing, he expresses his gratitude and kisses her on the head because she can now see herself as a silver sugar master. The page workshop is given the abandoned Holy Leaf Castle to work from for the next two months since it's closed to Lewiston. Glenn explains that it belonged to House Chamber who were eradicated by the royal family for starting an insurrection and gets a little startled when she hears that there are rumors of ghosts in the castle. She quickly strengthens her resolve when she remembers the huge responsibility on their shoulders. As they explore the mansion, it is revealed that the crest of the house chamber was completely erased and made a taboo by the royal family, even the pictures of the family were defaced. Anne heads to her room to unpack when she hears a voice calling to her so she runs out, Shell calms her down before he joins the rest to begin their work. Shortly after, he hears some footsteps and follows them, he's a little surprised to see footprints because ghosts don't produce them. That evening, Anne has Mithril stay with her because she's afraid. The following day, she joins everyone for breakfast, and they complain about the supernatural activities they experienced the previous night. Anne admits to having a bad night's sleep because all she could hear was doors opening and closing. They quickly change the topic to work as the head of artisans assigns all members to specific tasks. Their meeting is interrupted by Hugh, and as the Silver Sugar Viscount, he must inspect the work of the chosen school to make sure that they are working to the time frame and it's to the expected standard. The church has requested reserved sugar confects from the Mercury Workshop in case there are any issues. He leaves after his first visit allowing the team to begin their work. Later that evening, they are joined by Bridget who comes with a new companion fairy called Gladius. Later that night, the new fairy tries to make friends with Shell, but the guy is not interested, he just finds it odd that Gladius allowed himself to be bought as a companion fairy when he's a warrior type. The newcomer is impressed by how observant Shell is and excuses himself before his presence causes more trouble. Shell can see Gladius is made from opal. The next morning, Mithril gathers the fairies to suggest they capture the ghost running around, but no one is interested apart from Gladius. All the while, the artisans continue their work on the snow crystals for their masterpiece. After a long day of work, and prepares to sleep when Shell barges in and he senses someone in the room with her. He tackles the stranger which allows Anne to light a candle, the person gets annoyed and corrects her when she mistakes him for a ghost. He collapses soon after, so they put him to bed and inform Elliot. Shell concludes that their ghost was a fairy that could pass through objects. He later regains consciousness and reveals himself to be Noah, the page of the late Lord Herbert, he informs them that his master ordered him to protect the castle. He is certain that his master will return and begins to get hostile till Shell shows him that he has his wing too. This calms him down when he realizes that he's surrounded by fairy allies, they inform him of the fate of House Chamber which saddens him. Shell notices that Noah hasn't eaten properly so and later offers him some food, but he rejects it when he tells them that he can only eat food given to him by Herbert as per his orders. Anne excuses herself when she meets Gladius on her way down, the fairy caresses her as he comments on how sublime her silver sugar aroma is. She quickly leaves his presence to continue with her work, he turns to an annoyed shell and tries to find out his opinions on Anne, but he remains guarded. Gladius compares himself to Shell even informing him that they are the same type, 
and they are supposed to be together. Shell dismisses it as a joke till Gladius describes the darkened chapel where Shell was born. He leaves on that bombshell only raising more questions about his identity. Later, Anne takes a tour around the place with Noah and offers him one of the snow crystals, but he refuses to disobey his master's orders. He collapses again and is helped into bed by Shell. The warrior fairy uses this time to warn Anne to stay away from him. She heads back to the room with the family's disfigured portraits, she has a vision of how Herbert played chess with Noah while enjoying sugar confection with the family crest embedded inside. The day that Herbert left for war he ordered him to protect the castle and only eat the sugar confections he provided while he was in the castle. However, Herbert also asked him to leave and find something to eat if he ever got hungry. To prevent himself from leaving, Noah promised to never eat the sugar confections given to him. The vision ends with the spirit of Herbert pleading to end to save Noah. She's woken up by a rainstorm and a desperate call, so she heads to the sugar storage area to find that rain has soaked most of their barrels of sugar. They try to save the ones that have not been affected. Anne is upset for a little while but eventually pulls herself together and suggests they dry out the sugar in the hearth room. They will then grind it up for use. Hugh later arrives at the castle to see the damage and it's worse than he thought. He offers to have sugar sent to them but Elliot rejects the offer and promises that they will make it in time. After a hard day's work, Anne and Elliot have a meeting where they conclude that they need one more skilled artisan to help them. Cat comes to mind, so the following day, Anne rushes off with Shell to convince Cat to help them. He refuses and makes it known that he only wants to make things his heart is into. The guy also has orders to compete for the festival. Shell remembers that Cat owes Hugh a favor after losing a bet. So Anne strikes a deal with Cat which will guarantee his help if they can get Hugh to forfeit his favor. They rush back to the castle where she asks Hugh to give his pass to her. The Viscount guesses that Cat refused and denies to give something so precious for free. She challenges Hugh for the Cat Pass and he accepts. The Viscount has heard that there is a fairy who is having trouble eating. The objective is to feed the fairy. The victor will be the person who manages this and gets motivated when she sees how hard the others are working to grind the sugar. All the while, Hugh does his research by reading some forbidden books about the house chamber. He is later led by Anne to Noah where he asks the fairy some questions to further gather information. He learns about how Noah played chess with his master because no one else would. Herbert told him that everyone stayed away because he wasn't very good at the game. Hugh leaves after getting his inspiration and still struggles to figure out what to make for Noah. She goes to the portrait room for stimulation and after some staring something dawns on her, she asks Shell to move Herbert's portrait. Behind it, they find the lost crest of the house chamber. Despite being an act of defiance to the royal family, Anne decides to make the crest for Noah. Shell promises to protect her no matter the consequences. Mithril worries that she's attempting something taboo, but this vanishes when he sees the determination in her eyes, so he decides to help. She works diligently and finishes around the same time as Hugh. The Viscount presents his first and it's a perfect sugar confection replica of the chessboard Noah used to play. Hugh also reveals that Herbert was the kingdom's greatest chess master, which is why no one wanted to play against him. Noah finds this hard to believe. Seeing the chess set brings back memories, however, the fairy is still not able to consume it. Anne presents hers next and Noah's face lights up when she unveils House Chamber's crest which is made of sugar confections. Hugh gives a slight salty look because he knows he has lost this one. The fairy can't contain his excitement and eats it. He sees a vision of Herbert looking down on him with a smile. Noah gets upset for eating something other than what his master has provided. The Viscount puts another crest in his hand encouraging him to eat it with assurance that his master will not be angry. After Anne takes the win, Hugh pulls her to the side to inform her that making that crest is tantamount to rebelling against the crown. He wants to know if this reality caused her any hesitation. She confesses to feeling reluctant, but she overcame it because she believes that a sugar master must make what people need. Hearing this makes Hugh jump in shock. He nullifies Kat's obligation to him as promised. And later goes to check on Noah who is doing a lot better since he ate. She notices that the sugar confection that Hugh made for him has gone. Noah reveals that it was gone when he woke up so he assumed that the Viscount took it with him. He pleads with Anne to ask Hugh to return it to him so that he can treasure it. After some discussion the two get some sleep, Herbert's spirit gives its thanks to Anne because he can rest in peace now. Bridget later walks in on Gladue's eating at Hugh's sugar confection. She tries to stop him because it was made for Noah, but he ignores the lady and throws her to the floor. Gladue's continues to enjoy each piece commenting on the strength that dwells inside of him. He reveals that he was injured and has been searching for so long for the power to restore himself. 
The fairy is appreciative that he was able to obtain such high-quality confections. Bridget feels betrayed and squeezes his wing, but Gladius informs her that it belongs to a different fairy who's probably screaming in agony because of her actions. After dealing with her, Gladius confronts Chow and reveals that he's been looking for him for over 100 years. They were torn from each other through a sequence of unfortunate coincidences. Chow demands to know his true name and Gladius drops the bombshell that he's called La Fal Fen La Fal. This name sounds familiar to Chow. Chow recalls that he was born from obsidian embedded in the hilt of a sword forgotten in time. La Fel reveals that there was an opal and diamond embedded in that same hilt, he was born from that opal. The three precious stones were chosen specifically by the sword's master with the hope that something would be born from them. Chow wants to know who the master is, but La Fal is tight-lipped, he's only willing to reveal everything if Chow comes with him. Their destiny has already been decided and they are meant to be together. We learn that La Fal is the red-headed fairy from before. The two begin to fight when La Fal confesses his plan to kidnap In so that he can control Chow. After pushing him back with an attack, La Fal makes his way to the castle to take his prize, Chow rushes back to meet In safely sleeping in Noah's room. He hugs her relieved to see her unharmed. Meanwhile, Orlin is attacked outside the castle by La Fal. His yell of pain alerts everyone so they rush out. They quickly get him inside and start the treatment of his damaged eye. Bridget gets upset seeing the results of her actions and runs off. En chases after her but she's accompanied by Chow. Hugh volunteers to call the doctor for them since he's leading anyway. During that interval, Chow reveals what he has learned about La Fal to End before they arrive at Bridget's door. End tries to assure her that all this misfortune is not her fault, but the lady is not that delusional as she points out how her bringing La Fal exposed everyone to this danger. Meanwhile, the doctor finally arrives and stabilizes his condition. Elliot informs everyone that Orlin may lose sight and is left eye due to the attack. The fact that La Fal is after End is also a concern to Elliot, even with Kat's help. This means they are back to the same position with Orlin out. He suggests they take Hugh's offer to borrow them some silver sugar. This will affect them in the next year's selection and negatively impact their workshop's reputation, but at least they will have a better chance of completing their work. Anne protests this idea and bluntly states that they will complete their confections with their sugar. Her energy is infectious as they all agree with her conclusion. That night they work hard to make as much progress as possible. Noah wakes in the following morning revealing that he's going to be helping the other fairies with the work in the castle. She gets out of bed and rushes down when she hears that Cat has arrived, but she's surprised to see him. He tells her that Hugh passed by his workshop to inform him of what happened, so he came as promised. The master also delivers a summons letter from the church, so Elliot goes within who assures the head priest that they will finish the work given to them. She rejects the offer which would have the Mercury workshop finish the work on their behalf, However, they will still be compensated for their troubles. The head priest respects their decision and allows them to continue working as they head back to the castle and spots Jonas in a bad state. He is now a useless happy juice lover. She informs him that his name was cleared and Mr. Radcliffe wants to apologize and offer him a place back at the workshop. He's not interested in going back because Keith is still there so he will continue to be compared to him and made to feel like nothing. And offers a spot at the page workshop since they could use the extra help. After giving into his love for sugar confection he agrees to join them. Back at the castle, Bridget begins to shed her arrogant personality when she offers to help Nurse Orlin because she feels responsible. After a short while, Anne arrives with their newcomer to show him their operation. Jonas is liking what they have done so far. The briefing is cut short when Chow senses that LaFal is making his move. He rushes out to meet Elliot captured by the neck. Anne gives herself up so that Elliot can be saved. With Anne in his grasp, he then asks Chow to join them and forfeit his wing. LaFal confirms that it's his real wing before instructing him to follow as they ride off. The trio arrives at a castle in a cold region. Chow demands he releases Anne because they are too far away for her to escape, and he can't help her because LaFal has his wing. The Red Fairy releases her and gives Anne a room to warm up in. Chow consoles her that everything will be alright. He manages to get her to sleep and is soon joined by LaFell. The guy expresses his dislike for humans calling them barbaric creatures who took the form of fairies and only recently began to grow in intelligence. He offers to show Chow to his room, but he rejects because of the hostile nature they were brought to the place. Chow wants to know why he has gathered a unit of warrior fairies. They end up outside where LaFal talks about how the previous fairy king Rizelva tried to understand humans. However, the king of mankind Cedric waged a war on the fairies proving that they are incompatible. LaFal reveals that Rizelva was the one who gave them life, he was the owner of the sword with the precious stones. The king hoped that one stone would manifest and become the next fairy king, 
Both he and Chow were born, but the diamond didn't manifest. Chow denies this destiny which annoys La Fowl. The Red Fairy informs him of the reality that En's life will end before his. This will only lead to further loneliness on his part. La Fowl advises Chow to leave her. During that interim, he reports the situation to Downing who responds by doubling the guards assigned to the issue. Word also reaches the Radcliffe workshop so Keith rushes to the castle to get a read of the situation. He gets into an argument with Elliot thinking that they're not doing anything to help save in, but he points out that making sure that their work is progressing is the best thing they can do for her now. Keith comes to that realization and pleads for them to let him help despite his past with the school, and they agree. Back at the fort, LaFal brings a barrel of sugar for N to use to make confections. He threatens to end her and get one of her colleagues when she resists, but this threat brings her back in line. She runs out to find Chow when it's hinted that he helped with his raid to get the sugar, and finds the other warrior fairies who inform her that they gave their wings to LaFowl as a show of loyalty. This makes En so angry that she cries telling them that LaFowl is a fake king. Chow comes in and advises them to ponder on En's words as he escorts her away. One night, LaFowl leads another raid for Silver Sugar where he orders Chow to eliminate their captive, but he refuses so the leader gets someone else to do it. Chow punctures one of the barrels as they load the sugar into their cart to create a trail. LaFowl gets annoyed with the quality of the sugar confections Anne is producing, so he demands that she make them of the same quality as Hugh. She promises to do better when he threatens to replace her and quickly gets back to work. She's later interrupted by Lujul. As they discuss, it becomes apparent that Lujul has never eaten sugar confections before, so Anne makes one for her. She tastes it and feels energized. Lujul asks permission to take some of the confections to the other fairies who have come back injured from their operations. The following day, Anne brings more sugar confections to help them recover but gets a cold response from the other fairies. Lujul assures her that they are grateful, it's just that they hate humans based on the way they have been treated by them in the past. After a short while, some of them open to her a little more which gives her a chance to tell them that by giving LaFowl their wings they have only changed their masters. All the while, Hugh and Downing come across the trail of silver sugar left by Chow during their investigation. Elsewhere, LaFowl leads another offensive to free some captured fairies. The self-proclaimed king sends the rest back to the fort while he takes Chow to survey a town nearby. He tells his right-hand man of his intention to attack the town and use it as the cornerstone to rebuild a fairy kingdom. Chow analyzes the whole situation and concludes that LaFowl was captured by humans in the past and betrayed by his comrades. This explains his hate for humans and his lack of trust for those under him. This is why he asks for their wings. LaFowl gets upset that his path of revenge has been exposed, but he doesn't shy away from it. Upon their return, and makes more sugar confections to help with the fairy's recovery. LaFowl sees the work and gets angry that the ones she has made for them are of a higher quality. The others watch uncomfortably as he drags her off to dispose of her. They inform Chow of what happened, and he quickly rushes to save In before LaFowl finishes her off. The bootleg king crushes Chow's wing to show him who is boss but Chow manages to order En to get to safety as he winces in pain. En runs out to inform the other fairies of the danger Chow faces. They capture the human to bring her back to their king. He commends them for capturing her and as he comes to reclaim En, Lujul grabs Chow's wing from the king and returns it to its rightful owner. He wastes no time beginning his assault on LaFowl. This allows the fairies to escape. The king calls his subordinates traitors as he defends the onslaught. Their clash causes the floor to collapse so they take things to the rooftop. LaFowl jumps off when he realizes that Chow will never leave in and that a sizable human force has found his base of operations. The other fairies prepare to fight the humans, but Chow informs them of LaFowl's demise and is just happy to see that Chow is okay. He gives the remaining fairies their wings back and advises them to escape and be free. After the area is cleared, Chow and En return to everyone's delight. She is relieved when they reveal that they have finished the work with 10 days to spare. With this extra time, they decide to make one more show-stopping display. That evening, Bridget informs En that she's not marrying Elliot since they are not compatible. All the while, the team work hard as they move all the confections to the church and put their final touches to it. The night of the festival arrives, and the sugar confections come to life to everyone's amazement, Glenn can't believe his eyes and is stunned that confections can be displayed in such a way. Hugh commends Anne on a job well done and informs her that with her feet, the page workshop will make an instant comeback. The Viscount advises Anne to think about what her next move is. Elliot interjects which Hugh takes as his cue to leave. He advises Anne to travel and get more experience but reminds her that the page workshop will always have a place for her. She watches on as everyone has a good time at the festival 
and informs Chow and Mithril that they will be leading the workshop to further improve her skills. Chow informs her that he is willing to follow her wherever their adventures take them. That brings the season to an end.